Is there actual evidence for the conquest of Jericho as recorded in the book of Joshua? Our guest today, archaeologist Dr. Titus Kennedy, believes the answer is yes. There were a lot of different opinions, a lot of different interpretations. As an archaeologist would say, it didn't happen. So clearly there was something there in the late Bronze Age. Archaeologists can agree on a lot of facts and even interpretations of Jericho, including Titus, it's always good to have you back, my friend. I've been looking forward to this conversation. You ready to rock and roll? I am. Let's talk some archaeology in Jericho. Well, let's jump in and just start with the site, because I really want to know how confident you are and other scholars are that Tel es Sultan is the biblical Jericho and how we know that. Well, there's the consensus within the archaeological community that mm. Tel es Sultan is Old Testament Jericho, and we know this for a variety of reasons. Uh, first, Jericho has name preservation from ancient times, and then the mound of Tel es Sultan is really the only possible site for Old Testament Jericho in the area. There are no other substantial mounds or tells in the area. Uh, we have New Testament Jericho, that's located just to the west. And okay. that Roman period location of Jericho is also mentioned by people like Strabo in the first century. Okay, so Jericho migrated a bit, but it's in the same area. We've got the modern town of Jericho, which of course gets its name from antiquity. And then at the site of Tel es Sultan, a scarab from the Middle Bronze Age was found hmm. that has this inscription seems to contain the name of an earlier form of the place named Jericho. So basically we have ancient name preservation throughout the centuries, and we have no other viable candidate for the mound of Jericho other than Tel es Sultan. Okay, so just for clarification, this is not just Bible-believing scholars who say we've got to find a place because we know the story happened. These are people who hold a very different view of the scriptures, say this is an ancient city called Jericho. Right, absolutely. Uh, scholars, archaeologists are in agreement that Tel es Sultan is the site of Jericho. Okay, so you've written a recent journal article in which you are documenting a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about. But let's also kind of begin and lay the groundwork of what is an overview of the site? What is the site actually like? How big is it? What do we see at Jericho? So Jericho is located on the west side of the Jordan River. It's below mm -hmm. sea level. It's very, very hot there for half the year. But it has a spring with a constant water supply. Mm. Ein Sultan, sometimes associated with Elisha. And this made it a great place for a settlement. So there's an early town there that built using circular shaped houses. And then, then there was this famous Neolithic tower at Jericho that was constructed. A lot of people know about that. Uh, it was excavated by Kenyon. And following this period, there's an early Bronze Age city that the people there eventually built a wall around, a fortification wall. Um, by the way, that, that period of the city, early Bronze Age, suffered a massive earthquake, and Jericho is located in an earthquake zone where a lot of major and destructive earthquakes have happened over the centuries, okay. with the most recent being in 1927. That's mm. just, I mentioned that because we'll, we'll talk about that kind of thing a little bit later. So then, though, we get to the biblical period eventually. So the city continued on and expanded. And in this period called the Middle Bronze Age, Jericho had an impressive wall going around the whole site in an oval shape. And the final version of this wall was built in what's called Middle Bronze Age three, somewhere around 1600 B BC, uh, possibly slightly earlier. Uh, but this fortification wall was both stone and mud brick. So it had a stone retaining wall. People build okay. these still today. And that stone retaining wall part was about 15 feet high. But on top of that was an upper wall, what we might call the city wall, made out of mud brick. And this might have been more than 20 feet high. So it, it was hmm. the huge city wall. So this, this one that we're talking about with this massive fortification wall, this Middle Bronze three construction, this is referred to as Jericho City 4. Mm. 
or or it can also be called the final Bronze Age city because after this there was no more city there in the Bronze Age. So Jericho at this time probably also had gates on both the east and west. There was a tower on the east near where the spring is. The spring important water supply there. You need it for the life of the city. Uh, there was at least one major temple up on top on the Acropolis, and there was also a palace on the Acropolis. So then, then this city four was destroyed, and it mm. was not rebuilt for centuries. And that's that's what we're going to go into detail okay. about more. But there's some other things we should understand about the city after that. So after its destruction, the city wasn't rebuilt for centuries. There was mm. there was a residential building, residential mm. structure, called a mansion or something, at the site. And it was briefly occupied in the 14th century BC, but the walls of the city were not rebuilt. The rest of the city wasn't inhabited. So this was a, a short term, uh, single building residence at Jericho. It wasn't until what we call Iron Age II in about the 9th century BC when the city of Jericho was rebuilt. The actual city was rebuilt. And, wow. and this is mentioned in the biblical text this period. Uh, it was destroyed again by the Babylonians in the 6th century BC with that campaign of Nebuchadnezzar. There was a little bit of occupation in the Persian period following that. And then in the Hellenistic period, it, the, the mound, Tel es Sultan, was abandoned. Okay, So no one lived there anymore. And they moved the town to the west where the Wadi Kelt is. And so that was the new Jericho. This is what eventually becomes New Testament Jericho it had the palaces of Hasmoneans and Herod the Great. Uh, Jericho seemed to be a pretty substantial city in the first century, had a theater, a stadium, uh, probably a gymnasium, and it was a major farming area. And then that's the, that's the end of the biblical period. So just to give people an idea of what's going on at Jericho and the movement of the site. Okay, so you described how the walls could be up to like 20 feet tall, potentially, with the mud bricks. How big was the city of Jericho during, I think you said it's City 4, during the biblical era, if we date it to, say, the 15th century? Like how many acres, how many football fields? Just give us a sense of the scope, mm -hmm. if you will. It covered about 17 acres, which is okay. larger than archaeologists used to think, but uh, the more recent excavations have clarified that a bit. Now, a little bit of the site is missing. Part of the eastern half was cut because of a modern road, but but we can see the approximate uh, outline of where the wall would have gone. So about 17 acres. Wall okay, city. so a football field is about 1.3 acres. So doing the math on top of my head, that's somewhere between maybe 13 and 14 football fields to give people a sense of how big it would have been at that time with a 20 foot wall going around it. Does that seem about right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So let's, I'm curious personally in your interest, because you've dug in a lot of different places, you've written on a range of different archeological topics, but you just published this uh, journal article article that's getting a little traction on this. What first interested you specifically in Jericho? I was doing research during undergrad when I was studying history and archaeology, and I came across a lot of different archaeological discussions of Jericho relating to both Joshua and to the Gospels. And initially, I found this site to be quite confusing. Uh, there mm. were a lot of different opinions, a lot of different interpretations, different sites, of course, so different yeah. archaeological site names for the Old Testament and New Testament. And a lot of conclusions out there and not really sure what was what was correct. In fact, not even sure which data was original and correct in, in some time. So I wanted to try to understand what the facts were and get a grasp on the archaeological data and the plausible interpretations. And uh, I was primarily interested in the the Joshua narrative in that time period as it related to Jericho, although I also wanted to understand this New Testament gospel period Jericho as well. 
How much time have you spent there personally? I've been there once. I've been to Israel, I think, four times. But our mutual friend, Joel Kramer, took uh, myself and a group of others maybe 12, 15 years ago. And to see it on hand was pretty cool. But how much time have you spent there yourself? I've spent many days there. I don't know exactly how long. Uh, some days uh, doing research, some doing photography. Uh, sometimes they're talking to the, the excavation supervisors and talking mm. to them about what they're finding at the site. And then I've also spent a lot of time going through the, the museum storages, looking at some of the pottery from the various excavations there. Uh, so some of it's stored you know, nearby on hand and others is, is scattered in different cities. But uh, put, put a substantial amount of time but unfortunately haven't myself excavated at this site. You have AI though, which is obviously close related to it, but not Jericho, isn't that right? Yeah, I've excavated at other sites in, in the region that are from okay. the same time period. And so I've got a firsthand understanding and acquaintance with the, the Bronze Age, Middle Bronze, Late Bronze, these same types of cities in the Central Highlands region. Okay, so let's start shifting back to your article and the case that you make. But to frame it, what is the heart of the debate about Jericho? You said there's no debate about the location that's agreed upon. So where is the heart of the debate? And are there any other areas scholars agree on? And then maybe where's the heart of the disagreement? Well, the primary, primary disagreement for Jericho uh, comes with the timing of the destruction of the city of city four okay. and also the identity of the attackers. So mm. archaeologists can agree on a lot of facts and even interpretations at Jericho, including the manner of the destruction of the city. But it, it comes down to a debate about when exactly did that happen and who destroyed the city. Okay, so when when do you think uh, the destruction actually took place? And maybe lay it out for us, biblically speaking, like what do the scriptures reveal, as you see it, about when the date of the conquest uh, should be? I know kings and judges and chronicles weigh into this in different ways. So give us your dating from the scriptures first. We'll come to the archaeological record. And what are some alternative dates that Christians might offer as well? So archaeologically, there are multiple destructions of Jericho, but biblically, we have the main one in the book of Joshua. How do we get to some sort of date for that? Well, as you as you mentioned, there are three primary passages. So there are three separate sources, three separate books with different authors written in different time periods in the biblical text that all converge independently on about the same date. So we have first Kings six, one, which of course that's pinned to the Exodus, but we can derive the date of the conquest from the Exodus after the 40 years of wandering. So we get 480th year from the fourth year of Solomon, and then we get 40 years of wandering and they, they show up at Jericho. So it's, it's around 1406 BC, according to that text, uh, judges 1126 says the Israelites have been in the land on the east side of the Jordan for 300 years in the time of Jephthah, which was around 1100 BC. So you're, you're getting to 1400 BC approximately there also when, when they showed up in this area, you know, right, you know, maybe right before crossing the Jordan to Jericho. And then you have first Chronicles 6, 33 to 37, which gives a genealogical list and it has we would you might say 18 full generations and two half generations between the time of solomon and the exodus so 19 generations various studies have been done on generations during this time period and it usually comes out to between 22 and 28 years if we just go in the, the middle of that for use for a ease of use 25 years for a generation times 19 generations that's 475 years from solomon that 
you know, that's uh, for the Exodus again. You got to subtract the 40 years for the wandering. That once again puts us right at about 1400 BC uh, for the beginning of the conquest of Joshua getting to Jericho. So I think those, those three sources converging uh, give us a time frame to investigate archaeologically and okay. see what we've got archaeologically at Jericho. Now, because there's different datings of the Exodus, y you hold the 15th century. There's also a 13th century dating. What are some of the alternative dates, <clears throat> excuse me, amongst Christian scholars, not so much non-Christian scholars, for the conquest? So there's a 13th century conquest, which uh, more specifically might be about 1225 BC, somewhere around there might, might be a suggested date. Um, others keep it more roughly late 13th century. Some, some actually would uh, push it into the 12th century as well. So in, in that general time frame, and, you know, archaeologically, then we, we would be looking at destructions near the end of the 13th century BC to correlate with those uh, conquest accounts. Now you have you and I have had a conversation about where the evidence for the Exodus points, and I've actually had people on my show to make the 13th century case and the 15th century case, so people can hear kind of both perspectives. Uh, but obviously, with the 15th century case, that'll lead straight into a specific dating for Jericho right immediately after the time of the Exodus. So it's important for people to see that those things are connected. How how can archaeologists date events or structures at Jericho? So now we're looking outside of the scriptures. How do all scholars, or in particular non-Christian scholars, date events such as at Jericho? Pottery is going to be the main way that we do so because of how much is found, that it's preserved, and that it rapidly changes form rapid, rapidly in archeological time, you know, every 50 or hundred years. Uh, scarabs also from this time period, coins from later time periods. And you may have some epigraphic material writing like okay. a clay tablet, cuneiform tablet or, or something else uh, like at Jericho, they found what's called Lemelec seals. They've got hmm. Hebrew stamp impressions on them. So different things like that. Sometimes the stratigraphy also can help us figure out the date of it. That is the different layers, what's going on in those layers, what might correlate to a historical account or how uh, how that layer could be interpreted in terms of a period of vacancy. Um, and then we also, of course, have radiocarbon tests, which mm. can help but depending on the quality of the samples and also depending on the time period they may or may not be accurate enough to solve certain questions okay so i'm going to come back to radiocarbon but it sounds like it's a range of different pottery uh scarabs tablets that are found and you kind of piece them together a range of different voices to try to land where this thing happened historically now, you, you dating the conquest at 1400 BC, is this the mainstream view amongst Christian scholars? Is this a minority view? Is it 50-50? And I mean Christian, just kind of broadly Christian scholars. Where does your position land amongst most Christian scholars? That would be really hard to say. I okay. think maybe it's probably... Uh, half and half, but okay. If we, if we just talk about scholarship in general, I think that's something that we can speak to a little bit more accurately. And in in scholarship in general, in in archaeology, even specifically, the the majority view is that there was no conquest of Jericho. Mm -hmm connected to the Joshua account, okay. at least not in a historical way. Mm. Some, some scholars speak of it as an etiological legend. Like, yes, there was a destruction. The Israelites found out about that much later. Mm. 
they put it into an origin story for themselves. But most archaeologists would say uh, there's no evidence of the Joshua narrative connected to archaeology. And while they would say, yes, there's a destruction, they would say that it happened too early for the biblical account to be associated with it. And so what you get at Jericho then is just an abandoned city when when Joshua is supposed to be there. So that's that's the general view. Uh, as far as what Christian scholars today are thinking, uh, we'd probably have to do a survey to figure out how, how that works out. There are several on both sides of that. Okay. That, that, that's totally fair. So I want to ask you one more about radiocarbon, and then we're going to start to walk into this evidence that you lay out in your uh, recent journal article. And then we'll talk about where you think scholarship is headed. Some, are some people maybe being persuaded by this kind of case? But we're talking about kind of how we date when this conquest allegedly happened. You mentioned there's pottery, there's scarabs, there's other fashions. You threw radiocarbon in there. But what do we know about radiocarbon dates and maybe what are some limitations that it tells us and what it reveals about the date and destruction of Jericho? So radiocarbon, you need to have good samples that haven't been corrupted. You also okay. need to have calibration. And for the Bronze Age in the Levant, we have known problems with radiocarbon mm. calibration dates. Generally, they show the dates to be earlier than the historic dates. So the calibrated okay. radiocarbon date usually turns up earlier than the dates that would be derived historically or from archaeological material such as pottery. So that's, that's a limitation. I think it'll continue to improve over time as, as we acquire more data. But it can give us a range, but okay. it can't necessarily solve the the question of what was the specific year. You know, we, we might be able to okay. say uh, the radiocarbon dates, they lean towards a destruction in the 16th century BC or, or the 15th century BC, but they don't seem to point towards a late 13th or early 12th century BC destruction. And okay. that's about all we can say right now with the radiocarbon dates. That's really interesting that it's not definitive and we need to do more tests, but it does suggest the 15th century more than the 13th century, which if that stands also would be interesting as it weighs into the Exodus, uh, but we digress. Okay, so let's get to the story itself in this case that you're laying out, which I find super interesting. What Start by maybe telling us what are some of the key details of the biblical story that we should expect to find in Jericho if the biblical account is true. So we have the time of year is known, first of all. Mm. It's sometime soon after Passover has been celebrated. So it's late spring that this is allegedly occurring. And then they, they get to Jericho and they describe Jericho. It's a walled city. It has okay. gate. So we should expect to find that. Uh, then it talks about the collapse of the walls okay. and that the, the people are able to walk up into the city. So there's some way that this was facilitated, that they walk up into the city you know, over the collapsed wall. And then the city is burned. So there's a total mm. destruction of the city, but there are explicit instructions to not loot the city except for certain metals. So everything else is supposed to be left behind, which hmm. we, we could see evidence for that in the archaeological record. Then it says that the city was abandoned. It was left destroyed for a long period of time. It was cursed. And we have to we have to read later in the biblical narrative to find out. But in Judges three, there's the the brief time that Eglon of Moab mm. lives in this this little mansion house uh, at Jericho, even though the rest of the city is does not uh, 
occupied, hasn't been rebuilt, doesn't have walls. Uh, so there's that brief time. And then it, it's not until the ninth century BC when the city is actually rebuilt. So those are some of the basics that we can look at the biblical narrative and we can compare those to what's found archaeologically. We've got manner of destruction and we've got essentially a, a historical stratigraphy type of information as well. So we don't even have to look at the specific timing chronology of that destruction yet. We can look at that later, but we can just see, does the manner of destruction, does that match and, and do the other accounts about the fate of the city, do those also match? Okay, so I want to make sure that folks watching this follow your methodology, that you're starting with a biblical text and saying, okay, if this story reports a historical event, we have certain markers. For example, when it happened, shortly after the spring harvest, uh, describes walls that had fallen, maybe we would find this, a city that was burned, etc. And then you go look in that layer and see if these kinds of things match up. That's a helpful methodology so people understand how we're approaching this. Now, uh, last thing, and I want to take these one by one and see what you think. Uh, our buddy Joel Kramer did a, maybe maybe a decade ago, he did a documentary, and he described how like a cake is how tells work, like layers of a cake. If you can imagine like a cake that has one, two, three, four layers, is they would build city on top of city on top of city, and the reason might be because there was a strong foundation. It might be, like you said, water that runs through. It might be a safe locale. So when you look at Jericho today, it's not that you see this exact layer because other cities were built on top of it years later, you described. But as you dig down below it, you come across the city of Jericho 4. That's where we would discover some of the remains that you're talking about. Is that fair? Did I capture that right? Right. And if you look in some of the trenches, like trenches that Kenyon dug, uh, you can see this archaeological layer. And it's it's often about three feet in thickness of collapsed debris, destruction, fire, buildings, pottery, etc. So, yeah, you can see those different layers, layers of a cake, so to speak, to use that illustration as you dig down through. OK. All right. So let's take these one by one, some of these markers that you give. Uh, from Joshua, describes this being shortly after the spring harvest. How could you possibly know when a conquest took place seasonally, not just a year, but how could you possibly corroborate something like that? Well, one indicator would be if the city has a lot of grain still in storage. And so at Jericho, that's what was found. It was actually one of the very odd things that was found. Mm all these massive storage jars full of grain and in fact barley so we can connect it to the barley harvest of march april and we would say it must not have been too long after that because all these jars are just full of grain so they haven't been eating through it for months and months but this is something else that not only does it connect to that timing portion of the biblical narrative, but it's also odd in the methodology of siege warfare, because normally armies would go out to besiege a city before the harvest so that hmm. the people in the city would be starved out and the army could then take the food and, and feed themselves from the field. Well, Jericho is the opposite of that. And we also see the opposite of typical siege warfare at Jericho in the way that the walls were destroyed. Okay, so you described that Israel was told to go in and destroy everything except things that were metal, if I heard that correctly, or maybe I flipped it. Yeah. So it makes yeah, sense to... They were, they were to loot the metal, take to the treasury, and they were to leave everything else there and destroy it. Okay, so in a sense, even if they did attack at a time that normally armies at that time didn't attack then they would still take the grain. They wouldn't leave it unless there was a higher commandment and reason to do so. So this doesn't prove that, but you're saying this matches up with what we would expect if the biblical account got it correct. Is that right? 
Right. And it's not just matching. It's that it's essentially the opposite of normal practice. So okay. it's very strange that it would be there. Could it be a coincidence? Sure. But when you get too mm. many coincidences all lining up, that's when you have to ask yourself, is this actually connected to the historical text? That's a great question. Now, uh, it, in some ways, when I went to Jericho and I talk about this stuff, I can't get children's books out of my mind, like children's Bible study books, march around the city, blowing trumpets, like all this stuff. But you described the walls of the city falling. Now, of course, that is in the biblical account, but does that match up in the time and the place, at least roughly, uh, of the Jericho when you look at the record? So you've got the walls of the city. They're there. Okay, They're built sometime before Joshua arrives, uh, you know, it, probably 200 years, something like that. They're in use for a long period of time. In fact, many sites in Canaan had these, this same type of fortification system and they okay. were used for centuries. They're, they're tough, but the walls at Jericho, they, they collapse, but they don't collapse into the city and they don't collapse at specific points. Like you have a siege warfare going and breaking the walls down or, uh, or climbing over the walls even. Instead, you have a collapse of most of the wall around the city except for the northern portion of it so this is also very strange and this mm. this caused uh, some investigators to think that maybe there is another one of these massive earthquakes at jericho oh, which okay. happened before this and have happened after this multiple times and use that as a mechanism for explaining the odd way that the walls collapsed you know they collapsed and fell down upon themselves and in front of the wall, basically forming a ramp in front of the retaining wall so that you could just walk up the rubble of the fallen wall and enter the city. And that's exactly how things are described in Joshua 6. So is it possible that God used an earthquake to do this? It's not either or. Uh, the key is whatever mechanism was used that during this time it fell not in the typical fashion of like ramming one specific spot, but a wholesale fashion that enabled people to enter into the city. Yeah, I think the, the exact mechanism isn't the important issue because I okay. don't think we can necessarily discover that. We can't reproduce it really. And we weren't sure. there, but, but we can see the effects of it and how those match to the text of Joshua. And we can also see how it contrasts with typical siege warfare of the period. That's good. I think it's important for people to realize that if there was an earthquake, that doesn't imply that God didn't do it. Like we see with splitting the Red Sea, God sends an east wind and that causes it. So I think you're right that the mechanism is secondary really to the effect. Okay, so we have a timing that seems to match up. We have a wall that falls in a strange, bizarre pattern that would seemingly match up. But you also said the Joshua account describes that the city was burned. Do we find that at this layer? And is that different from other layers in, uh, in the tell? Yes, it's a massive destruction across this layer, Jericho City 4, 4C actually. Fire destruction, it's described by ex multiple excavators as an intentional destruction. So it wasn't just a building here and there that got burned. It's the entire mound, and it's a, a thick layer of ash is found wow. there. So the roofs of buildings collapsed, and everything burned. As I mentioned earlier, some places you can see in trenches about three feet thick of this layer of ash and debris from the destruction of that city. So that's another manner of destruction that matches the account. So as you go through Jericho, are there other layers that were burned? Uh, how does this compare to some of the other layers that are there? There, there are other layers that also suffer destruction, uh, but this one we can clearly point out as a total fire destruction. 
and we okay. have comparisons at other sites in the region also where it's obviously been some type of military attack and destruction and, and burning of the city but this isn't something that happened all the time at every site it's not like okay each city getting destroyed by a massive fire every hundred years or something okay so did i hear you say correctly that what we find here in jericho other cities date to the same place and the same kind of destruction then which would seemingly match up if the israelites were commanded to destroy a few of the different cities doesn't prove it could have been somebody else but that's a further coincidence when we get outside of jericho is that right yeah and i was speaking more broadly that we have okay archaeological fire destruction but but yes in terms of other conquest sites also this is true Okay, fair enough. All right, so so far we have the timing with the spring harvest because of the grain, uh, the city falling in a unique fashion, creating a ramp up, and then you also have the city being burned, as it specifically says in Joshua. You said the debate is not about the location, and the debate is not about some of the walls falling or the city being burned, but that it was actually the Israelites who besieged Jericho. And that is an unmistakable component of the biblical account. So what record do we have outside of the Bible that it was Israelites that actually besieged Jericho? Uh, we don't have any source, any ancient contemporary source that it was the Israelites okay. who besieged Jericho and destroyed it. But we don't have any other record that, that another group or okay. army or nation destroyed Jericho. So. The, the Joshua account and other biblical mentions of it, that's our only ancient source talking about a destruction of Jericho. In fact, we just don't, we don't have any other extensive text talking about Jericho in this ancient time period other than the Bible. So it's really a, a toss up between, do you take the Joshua account as possibly being a historical account of the destruction of Jericho? Or is it a, a myth or, or a legend or some later invention based on, you know, an earlier event that they didn't participate in? The, mm. the uh, working hypothesis of some of the excavators of Jericho over the many years is, has changed as to the identity and, and to the timing of the attack. I mean, if we went all the way back to the early 1900s, the Austro-German expedition, they came to the conclusion that Jericho was destroyed about 1600 BC. Well, that that seems too early, according to all the later excavators. Uh, Garstang thought it was destroyed about 1400 BC, and he he thought that it connected very well to the Joshua account, and so huh. he identified the Israelites as the attackers. But when Kenyon excavated. She pushed the date earlier to about 1550, and she, she suggested that it was either the Hyksos or the Egyptians who had destroyed Jericho around 1550. Uh, and that, that has been the general consensus that stuck for a long time, that, that it may have been Egyptians around 1550, you know, after kicking the Hyksos out of Egypt. But there have also mm -hmm. been uh, later suggestions, in fact, uh, one very, very recently in an archaeological report on Jericho even allowed the possibility that Jericho was destroyed in the late 15th century BC by okay. the third. And the chronological scheme that that archaeologist is using puts then that destruction in late bronze 1B, so the end of late bronze 1, which is also where I think it happened. And uh, up up to as late as 1427 BC. Hmm. So he he's getting very close. He's not saying that's definitely what happened, but sure. he puts it out as maybe very close, you know, 20 years or so from what I have been arguing was the destruction point of Jericho, just by by a different identity of attacker because again it's the only source joshua is the source that we have that says who destroyed jericho okay so when kenyon and some others suggest maybe it was the egyptians or maybe it was somebody else there's no evidence for this they're just saying who had the means 
uh, who was potentially available this time and were hypothesizing them. So there's not evidence against them, but there's no positive evidence that the Egyptian carried out such a conquest. Is that fair? Right. Thutmose the third okay. did have campaigns in this region okay. during his reign, multiple campaigns. Okay. So maybe he went over there, but he records the cities that he destroys and mm. subjugates. He, he does not record Jericho okay. in any of the lists. So it's it's absent that and it's a it's a more obvious absence, I think, because he does record so many places that he conquered. And then if we get to some of the details on the timing of this destruction at Jericho, archaeologically, we can say that this final destruction of the city occurred after Thutmose the third. It actually it occurred probably during the reign of Amenhotep the third around fourteen hundred BC. So we, we might want to go over some of the, the chronological archaeological material since we've talked about the manor already. Okay, let's do it. Jump in. Go for it. Well, I mentioned pottery is going to be the primary method. So okay. that's the main way that, that sites will usually get dated or particular layers of sites. And the, the pottery at Jericho, there's a ton of it that's been excavated because of all these different expeditions that work there. But if you go back and you look particularly at the excavations of both Garstang and Kenyon, you have several years of digging, intensive digging there. Mm -hmm. We go through and we look, well, what, what was Garstang saying versus what was Kenyon saying? So Garstang was putting the destruction about 1400 BC at the end mm -hmm. of late bronze one, which, uh, as I said, appeared in the recent publication that that time period as a, as a possibility. Kenyon, though, came and she said, no, actually, we didn't find or she said she didn't find uh, this particular type of Cypriot pottery by Chromeware that would indicate to her then that it was destroyed at the end of the Middle Bronze Age, 1550 BC. Well, unfortunately, she never published her reports while she was alive. Okay. They didn't come out after she was dead almost 30 years later in the 80s. Wow. If you go back and look through those reports, you will see that lots of the pottery that she said wasn't there and that Garstang had said was there was, in fact, found at Jericho. Bichromeware, mm -hmm. also what we call chocolate on whiteware, which is indicative of the late bronze one period uh, there's also absence of a type called anatolian grayware which could indicate that it was again destroyed around 1400 i would say the absence isn't as strong as what's actually found so that that's the pottery story i think that it points to late bronze one late bronze one okay B. Uh, but there's other forms the other materials that we can look at the scarabs i think are very important because they can pinpoint more precisely than pottery can pottery we're looking at a hundred year period probably oh wow maybe 50 years in some rare cases but okay the scarab you can look at those and see who's the pharaoh on that scarab mm -hmm. what when was his reign so when was this produced and at jericho there's almost a continuous line of scarabs going through the 15th century BC mm. for these different pharaohs, uh, including Hatshepsut, Thutmose III, and Amenhotep III. Now, Thutmose III was really famous. Uh, people reproduced his scarabs later or kept them as heirlooms. So th that doesn't help us pinpoint as much. But Hatshepsut, they tried to erase her memory from existence mm. as some kind of heretic pharaoh queen. Mm. So hers would not have been kept around or reproduced much later. And then Amenhotep III, he wasn't any kind of great military leader or famous. So this is also not one that was reproduced after his reign. And he is in power right around 1400 BC. And he's the last pharaoh that's attested at Jericho before its abandonment. So the destruction seems to happen when he's king he's pharaoh that's around 1400 just like the pottery was indicating also hmm. uh there's a tablet a cuneiform tablet that was discovered there hmm. it was dated to the 15th century bc on the basis of epigraphy 
uh, it it looks similar to some of the other late Bronze One tablets that have been found in Canaan. So it's it's plausible. I wouldn't say it's as strong as the Potter okay. Scary information, but it, it also correlates and it's something else that's there. Uh, we talked about the radiocarbon test. They don't really help us yeah. to decide between 16th and 15th century, but they, but they push out 13th and 12th century as a possibility for the disruption. So, you know, it's possibly 1400 for radiocarbon. It's possibly 1550 for radiocarbon. Okay. You know, we don't, we don't know. It's just a frame time frame. And finally, we could get to the stratigraphy, which this, this doesn't necessarily give us a date, but we can correlate the different events that are happening in the different strata. So at Jericho, there's a destruction of a walled city, fire destruction, and then an abandonment. Okay. That's, okay. we see that in the Joshua narrative. Then at Jericho, there is a, a single residence. It's called the middle building that was occupied briefly in the 14th century BC. That could be correlated with Judges 3, Eglon of Moab having a residence at Jericho while the rest of the city was not rebuilt or occupied. Then we have a long abandonment until Iron Age 2 in the 9th century BC. And we see Jericho also gets rebuilt then in the biblical text. And we could go back over again the things like Nebuchadnezzar destroying it, Jeremiah mentions Jericho and so on. But there is a, a nice stratigraphic sequence that's laid out archaeologically that we can compare to a historical sequence biblically. And we can see how all those things correlate very well. And mm. the best situating time for that destruction then with this stratigraphic connection would be the cities destroyed by Joshua about 1400 mm. feet. And that's connecting with our other chronological data. Yep. Okay, so as I see it, bottom line is you have these biblical uh, pointers. Again, springtime, walls falling, burned city. They match up. There's other hypothesized means that this was destroyed, but no positive evidence that this was such the case. And in fact, even the pharaoh who had the means to do so does not list jericho as one city that he attacked which seems conspicuous by its absence but then we have this book that was written called joshua long before any of this archaeology was done and people were aware of this and it matches up and tells us what happened it seems to me at least given the external uh, confirmation you gave that doesn't tell us it happened exactly 1400, but kind of narrows it down within that range and doesn't contradict it, that it seems like, unless there's more to the story that I'm missing, that this is at least the most plausible or reasonable explanation that we have. Do you agree? How would other scholars push back on that summation that I gave? Yeah, I agree. I think it is the, the best explanation according to the data we have, the most plausible. And I think that the most pushback that can be leveled is the identity of the attacker. And that would be done okay. by throwing out Joshua as a viable historical source. But it's it's hard to argue with the, the rest of it. You know, the manner of destruction, it's all right there in the archaeology. So maybe an explanation might be offered uh, they went to Jericho and they saw the ruins and they wrote this story according to the destruction that they saw there and projected it onto the past. Okay. Okay. That's, that's in the realm of possibility, right? Sure. Uh, it seems not so plausible when there are so many details that are correct according to the archeological finds, but I don't know where else, where else the pushback is going to be. I mean, there's a destruction. There's the manner of destruction. It really is going to come down to, can this be connected to Joshua and the Israelites having perpetrated this attack? And then, again, the exact timing of it. Uh, that's, okay. I think, 
that's going to still be discussed, but it, it seems to me like there's, there's more and more data coming out that is narrowing that down. So apart from the book of Joshua itself, what would we possibly find that would specifically identify the Israelites as those who destroyed it? Maybe it's another, another text who writes about this. Maybe there's some inscription that's discovered. What are the kinds of things? Are people looking for this, or is it so broad that you can't really look for it and somebody's just going to serendipitously come across it potentially someday? I think it would have to be another ancient text, something like a okay. cuneiform tablet that was a letter or a record written by some of the Canaanites that mentioned that Jericho had fallen to Joshua or to the sons of Jacob or something like that, you know, that's got mm. a very clear identifier. Other than that, I don't think we, we can have any expectation. I don't think we would find anything at the site, like a, a monument that was put up and inscribed saying that Joshua was here and destroyed this. Sure. It, it's just, while there are things like that in antiquity, victory stile, it's not something that the Israelites did. So we can't expect mm. it from them. If it had been the Iron Age and the Arameans conquered it, sure. That's what was found at Tel Dan with the Tel Dan stele. You know, Mesha, the Mesha stele, another victory stele. But it's not something the Israelites did. That's really interesting. And it's fair to ask, what would we expect to find if this were true? Are there any other things you're aware of that those who would just be more critical... I uh, would say, well, this is something you should find, but don't. Or here's a challenge that needs to be answered before I would be convinced of this position. So Kenyon separated the earthquake or the falling, collapsing of the walls and the fire into two separate phases. So some people oh. look at that, they, they understand it or they interpret it as maybe that was a, a long time in between the two instead of events that connected to each other so that that might be an objection but it doesn't make sense that the walls would collapse and then 50 years later or something without rebuilding the walls the city would get burned you know they would they would rebuild those walls if there was anybody living there still so <clears throat> It's all one thing that happens at once. We have collapsed buildings in the fire destruction itself, which I think we can connect to the collapsing of the walls as well. So that's that's one challenge. Uh, the other, the other would be the date of it, really, and again associating it all with Joshua. So putting it in the 16th century versus the 15th century, and why. We've gone through the reasons for that specific pottery forms and scarabs, this tablet, uh, you know, in the article I write about, there's, there's more in-depth discussion of these things. Okay, so uh, you describe scholars are agreed that Joshua exists. Uh, we know where it's at. It was destroyed, but really differ over whether or not it's the Israelites that were responsible and the date of when it happened. You're arguing that we can date it to the Israelites, to the chronology within the scriptures itself. So are you like a John the Baptist out in the wilderness saying, hey, look at me, here's new research, like one out of a thousand scholars out there kind of pushing back from the evangelical community saying there's more to this than you're aware of? Uh, where, how does your position land? And I know it's new compared to the vast majority of scholars that are out there. And I'm curious what you anticipate might happen as some of this research comes out. So other people have worked on this issue in the past, and they're going back all the way to John Garstang, who was an agnostic, by the way, but he thought okay. that John account matched up with Jericho. Mm. And then Bryant Wood in the late 80s and early 90s worked on this issue, and he went back and reviewed the pottery from the, the Jericho excavations. Now there have been subsequent excavations since since that time, so we have even okay. more information. But he really pointed out, uh, he's a, his expertise is in pottery, that the pottery forms found there matched 
this late bronze one about 1400 BC time period and and confirmed uh, what Garstang had been saying rather than Kenyon's absence of evidence arguments. Uh, you know, there, there are other practicing archaeologists and some other ancient textual scholars out there that also share this view on Jericho. And then there are others that have a variety of different views ranging okay. from it has nothing to do with Joshua and the biblical text to it's a different time being time period of Jericho to, uh, you know, what are we even discussing this for? Let's do our <laughs> Fair enough. Are there some Jewish scholars that are working on this alongside some evangelical scholars that are arguing for this traditional date? Uh, I believe there are a few that are investigating archaeologically some of, some of this time period of Joshua and the judges, but uh, not not a lot. I mean, the amongst Israeli archaeologists, the the more common viewpoint is that the conquest either is myth or mm. it it sort of happened in the 13th and 12th century um, so it's there's very few people i would say in the field who are taking this position and you know we're talking specifically about jericho two of the major reasons for that is that kenyan sort of had the last word on things for a long time hmm. and then second is that uh this what she was saying connected well with the paradigm that William Albright, a very famous archaeologist in the 20th century, had had concluded about the conquest. So it was embedded in academia. It was written that way. It was taught that way. And so people are going to go with that view unless they have <clears throat> specifically worked on this issue or or a closely related issue for you know excavating one of the other sites that that connects to this narrative so if i was going to bring it kind of full circle would you say that probably the biggest objection to the case you're laying out is less factual as opposed to just somebody's worldview or assumptions about the historicity of the bible about the possibility of God's intervention is lying behind this just more worldview issues that is how people are interpreting the facts more so than the facts themselves. Is that how you see it? I think a lot of it is worldview. I think a lot of it is also just what people have been taught in mm. university or uh, in their textbooks or, or by their excavation directors about these sites and that there's a certain irrational resistance to associating this with uh, an account in Joshua. Mm. But I think that eventually it, it might get to the point that lots of the archeological facts are agreed upon, but the main difference I think is going to stay the interpretation of who were those attackers okay. and what mm. connection they have to the biblical text. Even, even if we agree about all the archaeological facts, the interpretation, you know, the historical interpretation, I think, is going to remain divided. Interesting. Well, certainly not impossible. We saw with David, there was a lot of doubt about his existence in the Tel Dan inscription. Of course, David's palace, now there's minimal debate. So, who knows what uh, what the future may hold with this. I want to let you just sum up your findings, but I'll read the last line, and this is very, these are great words of a sober academic not overstating his case. But at the very end of this article that I'll link to before uh, below, folks can read this. You say, thus, archaeological excavations and analysis at Jericho appear to place the destruction of the final Bronze Age city circa 1400 B.C., in a manner consistent with the account in the book of Joshua. So your conclusion is, after you look at all this, is that basically the archaeological record 
doesn't prove. It basically is consistent with the biblical account. Is that how you see it? Yeah, I agree. I think it is. It's consistent mm. with that narrative. And I think that that's what we can find in archaeology. We can we can find consistency and corroboration with those narratives. Uh, once we start talking about proving this and that, we, we get into a battle of semantics about mm. what proving means and what it takes to prove that. And we realize that in many cases, we can never prove to people really anything because their, their criteria might differ on it. But we can at least show corroboration of historical accounts and we can show that these things match that they are consistent with. And it seems that's all we could ask technically, right? You don't, we don't use prove in terms of history, but we have a certain set of data and expectations. Go to the archaeological record. If it's consistent with it, that seems to provide a certain kind of broad corroboration for the narrative itself, especially if that narrative, like Joshua and or the Gospels, seems to be a historical account and not a mythological account like other books in the Bible might be or books outside of the Bible. That's how I see it. Titus, always enjoy having you on. Anything I missed that you wanted to add on Jericho? I think we covered most of it. And if people want to dive in deeper to this, I encourage them to read the article and even follow uh, through some of the bibliography there on some of the earlier uh, mm. studies and reports. Excellent. It's always good uh, to have you on. Uh, this is a lot of fun. First time I've covered this topic uh, on my show. So looking forward to some of the feedback that folks will give to it. If you're watching, make sure you hit subscribe because we've got some other shows coming on. And we have Dr. Kennedy coming back soon to talk about certain archaeological findings that uh, support the historicity and journey and life of the Apostle Paul, which will be super interesting in that regard. Uh, so make sure you hit subscribe. If you thought about studying apologetics, uh, Titus teaches a class uh, at Biola Apologetics in the program that I am in every maybe year or two, kind of a weekend class on the Bible and archaeology. So you can come join the two of us. Information is below. We'd love to train you and equip you. Or if you want to learn apologetics but not quite ready for a master's degree, we've got a certificate program. We will walk you through some of the best lectures and just basic assignments to get up to speed on apologetics, and there's a very significant discount code below. Check it out. Titus, let's do it again soon, my friend. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Sean. My pleasure.